I am here with Dr. Worthman here in Beverly Hills, California. He is one of the uh, urologists that's a surgeon to the stars in Hollywood's rich and famous and really skilled. And Dr. Worthman is very skilled at um, dealing with azospermia. And this is a condition where men have no sperm in their ejaculate. Is that right? Correct. So first off, thank you for that very kind <laughs> flattering introduction. Um, yeah, azospermia is a condition that affects probably 1% of the male population, uh, maybe a little bit more depending on the type, um, and that is the condition where there's no sperm in the fluid that comes out. Well, how, how does that happen? What, what goes into that? So there's two different types of azospermia. We break it down into different categories because based on the category, we can figure out how to treat it. So the first is what we call obstructive azospermia, meaning someone has a blockage, an obstruction. So sperm are being produced normally inside the testicle, but they can't get out because there's a plumbing problem. The other is called non-obstructive azospermia, which means that there is a production problem, so the testicles aren't working correctly. And even though some sperm may be produced, there's not enough that can actually be seen in the outside world. Wow. So let's start with um, obstructed plumbing problems. What can be done? Uh, I'm guessing as a surgeon, you've, you fix some of these plumbing problems. So plumbing is something that potentially can be corrected. Uh, and the question is, is, what is the plumbing problem? Well, there are further ways to break this down okay. into something that is either congenital, meaning someone was born with, versus acquired, uh -huh. um, something like a vasectomy, which is probably the most common reason for a man to have a blockage in the plumbing, is they went in and they decided that they didn't want to have any more children and have the vas cut, okay. and blocked, um, and then they changed their mind later on. Um, something that um, is a condition that you can be born with is uh, being uh, a carrier for the cystic fibrosis gene and ha having uh, something called congenital absence of the vas, uh, whereby you're born without part of the vas deferens. So it's almost like having a vasectomy, it was just something you were born with. And as I alluded to, um, it's usually because someone has uh, a mutation in one of the genes that control or one of the genes that are responsible for cystic fibrosis. Um, so treating the problem is easy, but you have to be aware that there could be some congenital issues with children. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to how we treat these things, it really depends on what the cause is. So if someone who has a vasectomy, Vasectomies can be reversed microsurgically. It's a um, intricate operation, but they're very routine in the hands of skilled surgeons, and uh, I happen to do a lot of these. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have very good success rate in doing that. For someone with congenital absence of the vas, uh, what we essentially do is we go and we take sperm out from inside the testicle or the epididymis, which is the little organ on top of the testicle where the sperm are stored. This is a very, very minor type procedure. We do it under local in the office. Mm -hmm. But to use that sperm, uh, the patient's wife undergoes in vitro fertilization. Uh, so we take the sperm out. A doctor known as a reproductive endocrinologist will harvest a woman's eggs. And then in the lab, one sperm is injected into each egg under a microscope wow. to make embryos, grown out in a Petri dish. Mm -hmm. And then several days later, some of the embryos are placed back inside the uterus and hopefully uh, the woman becomes pregnant. So this is one of the uh, incredible miracles of our generation. So when you think about it, 25 years ago, before in vitro fertilization with ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, the portion that allows us to put the sperm directly into the egg, none of these patients with congenital absence of the vas could have babies, wow. couldn't father children. But with this technology, uh, almost all of them can father children. Wow, that's amazing. So you're actually able to go into the testicle with a, with a needle and pull out sperm. How do you find them? How do you know where they are? And is, you know, they're small. They're, they're very small. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is possible to do it with a needle, but I personally don't like doing it with a needle because of several reasons. Number one is I can't see where I put the needle. It's blind. Mm -hmm. So if you hit a blood vessel like an artery, mm -hmm. it bleeds, and that's a problem, number one. Number two is the needle can only extract a very, very, very tiny amount of sperm. Mm -hmm. 
uh -huh. and usually we want to get some more sperm so the doctor who puts it into the egg has more to choose from and then there's some left over to freeze so the man doesn't have to go through the procedure multiple times. So instead of using a needle, we make a tiny little cut, very, very tiny, and uh -huh. we use magnification. Uh -huh. And then we just open up the cover of the testicle just a little tiny bit, and we remove some tissue. And then I can see exactly what I'm doing. So if there's a blood vessel there, we can cauterize it so the patient doesn't bleed. Uh -huh. And then we can take out enough to freeze. Uh -huh. um, and then we put some absorbable stitches in, and the cut is so tiny, we just put a Band-Aid on it. Okay. So, and it's, it's it's the kind of thing where you can go back to work the next day. In the case where you know you have a normal production mm -hmm. and um, there's just a blockage issue, how many sperm can you get from one of these aspirations? So sometimes we can get lots of sperm, and the reason is because in this situation where someone has a blockage, sperm production is normal. Mm -hmm. So that means there's lots of sperm. You asked me earlier, how do you know where to go? How mm -hmm. do you find them? Because they're small. Mm -hmm. Well, when someone has a blockage, anywhere you go, there's going to be sperm because sperm are being produced everywhere and in reasonably large amounts. Okay. So from the epididymis, we may get hundreds of thousands of sperm, maybe even sometimes in the millions of sperm Wow. Um, in a blocked epididymis. From the testicle, a little bit less, mm -hmm. um, but you know, because for IVF cycle, maybe we need 20 or 30. Yeah. Um, it certainly gives us extra to try to freeze. Right, right, perfect. So are there other kinds of blockages besides the vas? Yes, so another type of what we call iatrogenic blockage, meaning caused by a doctor or by surgery, is somebody who had uh, bilateral hernia repairs. They had uh, groin or inguinal hernias, okay. and both sides were fixed, usually when they were children. Um, and they're fixed by putting in a little piece of mesh. Um, uh, or if it's when, uh, when the patient was a child, the vas is so tiny that the surgeon might not have seen it and might have kinked off. So every now and then, we'll find someone who has a history of either adult hernia repairs with mesh on both sides or pediatric hernia that have blockages. Okay. And uh, the treatment is essentially the same. We go and we take the sperm from the testicle. Uh, there are some men who develop blockages of their ejaculatory ducts. So the vas come up inside uh, the body mm -hmm. and meet with a little gland called the seminal vesicles behind the prostate, and then okay. they form a, a little a little Y connection that runs through the prostate through a very very tiny channel about a millimeter wide. Okay. And sometimes a prostate infection or a cyst in the prostate at, at these ducts can cause a blockage on both sides. And that can either be treated, once again, by taking sperm out because they're there in the testicle, or sometimes by unroofing or, or, um, or cutting into that area that's scarred uh, and opening it back up. I see. Is there a way for you to be able to easily identify these other kind of blockages? Do you, are there diagnostic techniques to find them? So there are. Sometimes they're easy, sometimes they're not. So for someone who has absence of the vas, it's pretty easy because all you have to do is examine the patient. And when you examine them and you can't feel the vas or you can't feel part of the epididymis, you have the diagnosis. Right. So I know a lot of doctors then order ultrasounds or transrectal ultrasound, which is a little bit invasive and wouldn't exactly be something that I would want to get unless I needed it as a right. patient. Right. <laughs> Whereas you don't need to do any of these tests as long as you have an exam that, where there's no so, vas that's right, felt. Right. You know, so an abnormal or an abnormality on, on the exam shouldn't trigger getting more tests like ultrasounds. Right. It, you sh it should give you the diagnosis. <laughs> you don't want to take it off the tablet because right. you don't have to. <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> you should write for Hallmark. Yeah. <laughs> Very sentimental. Uh, yeah, that was right from the heart. Yes. So absolutely. Um, and, and that's kind of important. I, I see a lot of guys who come in and they've had these big, big, big workups and they're not so comfortable and they spend a lot of money and they really didn't need it all. Someone needed to do was examine them and say, hey, you know what? I didn't feel a vest. This is what you have. Right, you right. Know, let's go get some sperm and, and spend the money actually doing something worthwhile, which is taking the sperm out because you can use it. We don't have to do huge amounts of diagnostic tests in these patients. You know, right. focus on actually giving them something that's worthwhile to treating the patient as opposed to just diagnosing them. Right. Are the ultrasounds useful for smaller smaller blockages? So the ultrasound for the testicles isn't really useful so much for a blockage outside of if someone had uh, an infection of their epididymis and their epididymis may be enlarged. Okay. But the ultrasound isn't really very sensitive in, in being able to resolve small blockages. Okay. Where the transrectal ultrasound becomes valuable is if you suspect somebody has a blockage in their prostate. Okay. And usually the, the key to the suspecting that is that the volume that comes out on the sperm test is very, very low. So if only one tiny little drop comes out, 
kind of thing, then I have to suspect, oh, maybe the blockage is in the prostate. And the reason is that about 95% of the fluid that comes out comes from the seminal vesicles and comes from the prostate. So if that fluid is very, very low, then maybe the blockage is all the way up by the prostate. Oh, okay. So it's, it's also looking at the seminal volume and exactly. really seeing, what, putting the whole picture mm -hmm. together. Exactly. And then maybe it's worth exploring and, and then, an ultrasound. And then maybe it's worth doing <laughs> All right. But you have to, you, you can't just do these tests knee jerk. Right. You know, reflexively, you have to know the patient, know the patient's history, and take the non invasive tests and put together a picture. Remember, as doctors, we're really medical detectives. Mm -hmm. You know, someone comes in with a problem, and our job is to solve the mystery as to what the problem is, why they have it, and how best to treat it. All right, well, let's switch gears a little bit and go into non obstructive. So, this is sure. where we're having a problem producing sperm Correct. in the first place. What are some of the causes of that, and are they correctable? What can be done? So the answer is that some of the causes are correctable, some aren't. Um, but the good thing, and the take-home message should be for this, that most men with non-obstructive azoospermia still produce some sperm, and most men can still be fathers, even if they have a production problem. So let me start by answering the first part of your question is as to what, what causes this. So um, some of it is genetic about 15 to 20 percent of men who have non-obstructive azoospermia have a genetic related issue, meaning they either have a deletion uh, on one of the genes that causes or that controls sperm production on the Y chromosome, mm -hmm. uh, or they have an issue with their karyotype, meaning their chromosome complement. They might have something called a, a translocation, where the part of one chromosome breaks off and switches places with another chromosome, and that can lead to produ sperm production problems. Um, but it's important that we check these things, and the reason is, is that sometimes it tells us that there's a really good chance of sperm, sometimes it tells us that there's a really bad chance of finding sperm, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, but also, we want to make sure that if we do find sperm and we use them to make a baby, that we're not going to make a baby that's genetically abnormal, so we need to check certain things and make sure that we know what's going on mm -hmm. before we just go ahead and proceed. So clearly the genetic issues aren't correctable. Okay. Um, some men have a varicocele, a varicose vein around the testicle, and, and in some instances the varicocele is significant or severe enough that it causes the sperm count to be so low that you don't see any in the ejaculate. Wow. And that's correctable in some men. Mm -hmm. um, something like 30 to 50 percent of men who have azospermia and a varicocele will have the return of sperm to their ejaculate after you fix the varicocele. Wow. But many of those men have sperm in the testicle that can just be removed and used without fixing the varicocele. So it becomes a, a, an issue where there's two potential therapies uh, for the patient, and that's, uh, that's a, another discussion. Right, uh, that's a, a financial discussion. A little well, bit it becomes in, in part a financial discussion, in part a how long do you want to wait to see the results thing, because if I say, hey, we can do a surgery tomorrow and find sperm potentially, or we can fix the problem and you can have sperm coming out, but it might take a year, Right. Some people say, hey, we want to have a kid now right. and want to move ahead. Do you have cases where people might do both? They get yeah. the sperm taken out and they mm -hmm. fix the varicocele for maybe baby number two? Yes, yes, and, and that, uh, that actually happens um, not infrequently. Yeah. Where someone will say, hey, let's go get the sperm um, and then let's fix the varicocele for the future. Or they um, don't have sperm when we go in and uh, then they want to fix the varicocele to try to get the testicle jump started to produce sperm, right. which sometimes happens, although infrequently it, it still can happen. Does the, does the varicocele cause permanent testicular damage and that you know, if, if it's been untreated long enough, it's gonna not really work so well? So that's a very good question, and I think the answer is yes. So the longer you have something that can cause damage, the more significant and severe the damage may be. But part of the problem is, is that the varicocele doesn't behave the same way in all men. In other words, I see some men come in in their 50s and 60s and they have reasonably good sperm counts and have big varicoceles. Mm -hmm. um, so the quality of their sperm might be affected, but they're still making lots of sperm. Mm -hmm. And then I have other men who might be in their 20s and they have a varicocele that's not quite as big, but they have azoospermia and the varicocele affects them 
more significantly, even though it's not as big and they haven't had it as long. So we have genetics and we have varicoceles. What are some of the other causes of uh, non-obstructive vases for me? So going back to the genetics, because I left out a big one, which is Kleinfelter syndrome. Okay. Kleinfelter syndrome is a situation where a man is born with an extra X chromosome, an extra female chromosome. So they have a Y chromosome, which makes them men, but they have two X chromosomes, and the addition of the extra X chromosome causes a dysfunction within the testicle, so the testicle doesn't work quite as well. And this has been another miracle of modern medicine. Until this generation, men with Kleinfelters were sterile. But we now know that in about half of men with Kleinfelters, we can actually go into the testicle and find sperm. Wow. So with IVF, half of the men with Kleinfelters can be treated. And Kleinfelters is very common. It's one in 400 babies born, male babies born, have Kleinfelters. Wow, I mean, that's a that big, is pretty big number. common. Very common. Wow, so are these guys um, diagnosed as babies? When, when do people find out that they have Kleinfelters? It's pretty unusual for them to get diagnosed uh, as a baby. Uh, and the reason is, is because the way to find out if someone has Kleinfelters is you have to do a karyotype, this blood test that I mentioned earlier that looks at all the chromosomes. And there'd be very few reasons why you would want to do this on, on a baby unless something else was going on. So you don't usually find out about Kleinfelters until, um, until these boys go into puberty, and they might have delayed puberty, some of them. Mm -hmm. Others won't have delayed puberty, but um, we find out about them when they come in uh, because they've been trying to conceive for quite a while and have zero sperm. Then when we examine them, they have a pretty characteristic um, appearance on exam. Usually uh, these patients are on the taller side. Um, and uh, the testicles are very, very small. They're usually the size of uh, grapes. Oh, wow. Um, so that kind of tips makes you off a little tips bit. Tips us off. It's a little that, tiny. Uh, yeah, yeah. That patient has Kleinfelters, but uh, it's another important point that as small as the testicles may be, still half of them have sperm. Wow. Little bitty guys making, making babies. We're, exactly. Oh, <laughs> well, that's good. Um, that's good. Amazing. So same procedure for taking it out. You go in, look at a microscope, find these sperm, mm -hmm. abstract them, and then use ICSI to, to go ahead and do an IVF cycle. So in general, yes, the procedure we use to take the sperm out in the non-obstructive patients is a little bit different than the procedure we use in the obstructive patients. Okay. So for the guys with the blockage where it's easy to find sperm that I do in the office under local, uh, for the guys who have non-obstructive azospermia, in those patients, it's harder to find sperm okay. because the testicle isn't producing sperm all over the place. It's only producing sperm typically in small pockets, and then it becomes critical that we find one of these pockets. Well, since the tubules in the testicle uh, where the sperm are produced, they're called the seminiferous tubules, mm -hmm. they're microscopic. You can't see them to the naked eye. Okay. Uh, so if you just went ahead and took a biopsy or took a random piece out, you might not get a piece that has sperm. So a procedure has been developed whereby we use a microscope when we open the cover of the testicle, a much more powerful microscope, okay. where we can then see the individual tubules. Wow. And because we found is in men who are making sperm, the areas that produce sperm or look different than, than the areas that are scarred and don't produce sperm. So we can use the characteristic of the appearance of the tubule, how big it is, how thick it is, what color it is, uh -huh. to try to differentiate between the areas where the sperm are and the areas where there is no sperm. And by removing just the little pieces that look best, that, uh, that uh, might contain the sperm, we accomplish a number of things. Number one is we double the chances of finding sperm. In, in these men. So for a non-obstructive azospermic patient, before we started using the microscope, the chances of finding sperm was about 30%. Oh. With the microscope, it's between 60 and 70%. Wow. The other thing is, is, I can do a lot less damage to the testicle because I can take much smaller pieces. Right. You know, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. It really helps if you have a magnet. Right. So if you're trying to find an area that looks different from a different area that's microscopic, if you have a microscope, you can differentiate the areas. Wow. And wow, so is this microscope like uh, goggles you wear or something you put over the, how does this microscope, what does it, it look it like? It kind of looks like a periscope on a submarine. Okay. It's on a stand and it kind of drops down over the patient and you, you look through it and it's got handles and it really 
very similar to a periscope. Oh, okay. And uh, this thing can enlarge um, the field by 10 to 15 times. Wow, wow. So it really lets us have a, have a good view. It seems like this is something then it's really good to have someone who's uh, experienced uh, so who can really look and say, yes, I've seen this. This looks like an area that has sperm versus one that doesn't. It sounds like this might be good for an expert to be doing this kind of surgery. So when you have a severe case, you might want to go to... Sure. And that's really a very important point. As we talked about earlier, there aren't a lot of doctors uh, who specialize in microsurgery for male infertility. Mm -hmm. um, and traditionally, it's, it's fallen under the, uh, the auspices of urology. So if you have a, blo uh, a, a blockage, any urologist probably can go and get some sperm. But if you have a production problem, if they're going to go and just do that same random biopsy, you have a 30% chance of having sperm found. If you go to a doctor who's experienced at doing these microsurgical procedures, and it takes a lot of experience to learn how to do right. this, because not only is it you looking for the tubules, but then you have to search for the sperm once you take out the tubules. So it becomes an issue of you have to have enough experience correlating where to look and how to look. Right. And how much to do and how little to do because at the same time we don't want to damage the testicles too severely. <laughs> so I know some of my colleagues, they kind of go to town on the testicle and really tell patients we're going to turn this thing inside out to find a sperm. Well, in my experience you don't have to go that far. You don't have to cause irreparable damage because my success rate is the same uh, without having to go quite that far. I see. I almost picture you with like a safari hat, like you're going to go find these, you know, rare endangered sperm and hunt them out and capture them and bring them back to the to the San Diego Zoo well, or something. It's a good image. It's just a surgeon's hat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's um, quite a service you do. That's uh, remarkable to be able to, you know, give these guys so much hope and opportunity to, to be able to father their own biological children when you know, probably many of them have been told that it would be impossible. That's really the most rewarding and satisfying part of, of my job, is to take people who have really been told that they can never be a father or have had multiple procedures that have been unsuccessful and go in and do something and actually make that difference and help them have a baby. It, you know, we're looking around the office earlier, there's a, a big thing of cognac, Armenian brandy over there. That was from a patient who was trying to conceive for 13 years Wow! and had multiple procedures and saw multiple doctors and went in and we found a few sperm and he had a baby and he was so, so thankful. Um, I mean, imagine, he spent 13 years of his life going through this. Wow. Wow. That is, that is so touching. All right. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and go into non-obstructive. So this is sure. where we're having a problem producing sperm Correct. in the first place. What are some of the causes of that, and are they correctable? What can be done? So the answer is that some of the causes are correctable, some aren't. Um, but the good thing, and the take-home message should be for this, that most men with non-obstructive azoospermia still produce some sperm, and most men can still be fathers, even if they have a production problem. So let me start by answering the first part of your question is as to what, what causes this. So um, some of it is genetic. About 15 to 20 percent of men who have non-obstructive azoospermia have a genetic related issue, meaning they either have a deletion uh, on one of the genes that causes or that controls sperm production on the Y chromosome, mm -hmm. uh, or they have an issue with their karyotype, meaning their chromosome complement. They might have something called a, a translocation, where the part of one chromosome breaks off and switches places with another chromosome, and that can lead to produ sperm production problems. Um, but it's important that we check these things, and the reason is, is that sometimes it tells us that there's a really good chance of sperm, sometimes it tells us that there's a really bad chance of finding sperm, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, but also, we want to make sure that if we do find sperm and we use them to make a baby, that we're not going to make a baby that's genetically abnormal, so we need to check certain things and make sure that we know what's going on mm -hmm. before we just go ahead and proceed. So clearly the genetic issues aren't correctable. Going back to the genetics, because I left out a big one, which is Klinefelter syndrome. Okay. Klinefelter syndrome is a situation where a man is born with an extra X chromosome, an extra female chromosome. So they have a Y chromosome, which makes them men, but they have two X chromosomes, and the addition of the extra X chromosome causes a dysfunction within the testicle, so the testicle doesn't work quite as well. 
and this has been another miracle of modern medicine. Until this generation, men with Klinefelters were sterile. But we now know that in about half of men with Klinefelters, we can actually go into the testicle and find sperm. Wow. So with IVF, half of the men with Klinefelters can be treated. And Klinefelters is very common. It's one in 400 babies born, male babies born, have Klinefelters. Wow, I mean, that's a that big, is pretty big number. common. Very common. Wow, so are these guys um, diagnosed as babies? When do, when do people find out that they have Klinefelters? It's pretty unusual for them to get diagnosed uh, as a baby. Uh, and the reason is, is because the way to find out if someone has Klinefelters is you have to do a karyotype, this blood test that I mentioned earlier that looks at all the chromosomes. And there'd be very few reasons why you would want to do this on, on a baby unless something else was going on. So you don't usually find out about Klinefelters until, um, until these boys go into puberty, and they might have delayed puberty, some of them. Mm -hmm. Others won't have delayed puberty, but um, we find out about them when they come in uh, because they've been trying to conceive for quite a while and they have zero sperm. And then when we examine them, they have a pretty characteristic um, appearance on exam. Usually uh, these patients are on the taller side. Um, and uh, the testicles are very, very small. They're usually the size of uh, grapes. Oh, wow. Um, so that kind of... Tips you off tip, a little tips, bit. Tips us off. It's a little that, tiny, uh, yeah, yeah. That patient has Klinefelters, but uh, it's another important point that as small as the testicles may be, still half of them have sperm. Wow. Little bitty guys making, making babies. Right. Exactly. Oh, <laughs> well, that's good. Um, that's good. Amazing. So the same procedure for taking it out. You go in, look at a microscope, find these sperm, mm -hmm. abstract them, and then use ICSI to, to go ahead and do an IVF cycle. So in general, yes, the procedure we use to take the sperm out in the non-obstructive patients is a little bit different than the procedure we use in the obstructive patients. Okay. So for the guys with the blockage where it's easy to find sperm that I do in the office under local, uh, for the guys who have non-obstructive azospermia, in those patients, it's harder to find sperm okay. because the testicle isn't producing sperm all over the place. It's only producing sperm typically in small pockets, and then it becomes critical that we find one of these pockets. Well, since the tubules in the testicle uh, where the sperm are produced, they're called the seminiferous tubules, mm -hmm. they're microscopic. You can't see them to the naked eye. Okay. Uh, so if you just went ahead and took a biopsy or took a random piece out, you might not get a piece that has sperm. So a procedure has been developed whereby we use a microscope when we open the cover of the testicle, a much more powerful microscope, okay. where we can then see the individual tubules. Wow. And because we found is in men who are making sperm, the areas that produce sperm are, look different than, than the areas that are scarred and don't produce sperm. So we can use the characteristic of the appearance of the tubule, how big it is, how thick it is, what color it is, uh -huh. to try to differentiate between the areas where the sperm are and the areas where there is no sperm. And by removing just the little pieces that look best, that, uh, um, that uh, might contain the sperm, we accomplish a number of things. Number one is we double the chances of finding sperm. In, in these men. So for a non-obstructive azospermic patient, before we started using the microscope, the chances of finding sperm was about 30%. Ooh. With the microscope, it's between 60 and 70%. Wow. The other thing is, is I can do a lot less damage to the testicle because I can take much smaller pieces. Right. You know, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. It really helps if you have a magnet. Right. So if you're trying to find an area that looks different from a different area that's microscopic, if you have a microscope, you can differentiate the areas. Wow. And wow, so is this microscope like uh, goggles you wear or something you put over the, how does this microscope, what does it, it look it like? It kind of looks like a periscope on a submarine. Okay. It's on a stand and it kind of drops down over the patient and you, you look through it and it's got handles and it really, very similar to a periscope. Oh, okay. And uh, this thing can enlarge um, the field by 10 to 15 times. Wow, wow. So it really lets us have a, have a good view. It seems like this is something then it's really good to have someone who's uh, experienced uh, so who can really look and say, yes, I've seen this. This looks like an area that has sperm versus one that doesn't. It sounds like this might be good for an expert to be doing this kind of surgery. So when you have a severe case, you might want to go to... Sure. And that's really a very important point. As we talked about earlier, there aren't a lot of doctors uh, who specialize in microsurgery for male infertility. Mm -hmm. um, and traditionally, it's, it's fallen under the, uh, the auspices of urology. 
So if you have a, blo uh, a, a blockage, any urologist probably can go and get some sperm. But if you have a production problem, if they're going to go and just do that same random biopsy, you have a 30% chance of having sperm found. If you go to a doctor who's experienced at doing these microsurgical procedures, and it takes a lot of experience to learn how to do right. this, because not only is it you looking for the tubules, but then you have to search for the sperm once you take out the tubules. So it becomes an issue of you have to have enough experience correlating where to look and how to look. Right. And how much to do and how little to do because at the same time we don't want to damage the testicles too severely. <laughs> so I know some of my colleagues they kind of go to town on the testicle and really tell patients we're going to turn this thing inside out to find a sperm. Well in my experience you don't have to go that far. You don't have to cause irreparable damage because my success rate is the same uh, without having to go quite that far. I see. I almost picture you with like a safari hat, like you're going to go find these, you know, rare endangered sperm and hunt them out and capture them and bring them back to the to the San Diego Zoo well, or something. It's a good image. It's just a surgeon's hat. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's um, quite a service you do. That's uh, remarkable to be able to, you know, give these guys so much hope and opportunity to, to be able to father their own biological children when you know, probably many of them have been told that it would be impossible. That's really the most rewarding and satisfying part of, of my job, is to take people who have really been told that they can never be a father or have had multiple procedures that have been unsuccessful and go in and do something and actually make that difference and help them have a baby. It, you know, we're looking around the office earlier, there's a, a big thing of cognac, Armenian brandy over there. That was from a patient who was trying to conceive for 13 years Wow! and had multiple procedures and saw multiple doctors and we went in and we found a few sperm and he had a baby and he was so, so thankful. Um, I mean, imagine, he spent 13 years of his life going through this. Wow. Wow. That is, that is so touching.